I've done it guys. Well, not quite, but close enough. Yes, I have what I would say, resist the urge. Now, how does this really affect my progress? Well, what I've done is I've done something I never thought I would have ever thought of doing before. And if you're one of those who watched a live stream uh, a few months back, I was doing some dishes at my previous job, and I think I had mentioned something about quitting. Yeah, so what that was, in case you need a little refresher, was quitting resort skiing. And that's exactly what I have done. And to think that I have actually made it an entire ski season without having used lifts, without having purchasing a lift ticket, I have done it. And what's so significant about this is skiing has pretty much been my number one passion when it comes to physical activity. So that might come as a surprise to a lot of people as to why I would make such a hefty sacrifice. But in the grand scheme of things, skiing and my love for it has made me make a lot of mistakes in life. You know, going all the way back to my teenage years when I dropped out of high school and became a ski bum, hoping to pursue the dream of becoming a professional free skier or what you would call a big mountain skier or ski for like those films. Oh, that never happened. And then of course, I continue to bum around, trying to see how many days I can get in each season, kind of trying to live to that dream, but kind of foregoing going to college, not really getting myself into a good stable job, working, you know, pretty much dead end jobs in most of my 20s. And then of course, Fast forward to when I came back after having lived in Florida, I once again came back with like, okay, I've got to be in an area where I can go skiing, where I can go hit up those resorts. And of course, it led me to make more bad decisions. And so out of 26 years in which I've lived in the state and I've been a skier, yes, I have done it. I have actually not once used a ski lift during the winter seasons in 26 years of you know living within an hour's reach of a ski area and why this is significant is by making this sacrifice it's not only enabling me to focus more on my priorities because let's face it every time i go skiing well you gotta look that you're spending anywhere from three to four hours of driving maybe as little as two and a half, three hours, but still, that's a big chunk of your day. Then you're spending another four or five hours at the very minimum on the mountain, because you're not gonna wanna do all that driving, only to ski one or two hours. And even if you did, that's still five or six hours of your day when I should be focusing on other stuff. Whereas what I'm doing right now, is simply going up this local trail. This is what, maybe an hour and 50, well, today's gonna be a little longer, because I'm, I'm walking it. But on a typical day, when I do this trail, I may spend maybe about an hour to get from here to where I'm at, maybe about 10 minute drive. So really, hour and 20 minutes, hour and a half, versus five hours, six hours, eight hours, hey, zen, zen. And so, that's a big chunk of time. And I know for a fact that if I had gotten a pass, because skiing is really not that expensive if you get a season's pass. How resorts make their money is they charge extra because it's, it's a business standpoint. Yes, the, the, the urge to want to go skiing because skiing is my number one passion. And like on a day like today, my favorite time of year to actually ski is March and April if I'm using ski lifts. So like today on the mountain, would be one of those days where the snow is softening, you get some fast turns in, hit up the ski park, and so forth. But because I, you know, I did not let myself get a season's pass because there are priorities I'm focusing on first, I'm not up there spending 
six, eight hours on the, getting, you know, getting to the mountain, on the mountain and back. And then by the time I get back, then I'm like, oh, well, I don't feel like doing anything else. So essentially what I'm getting at is all that time I've been, you know, saving myself from resisting the urge to go skiing has been in productive mode. So what have I done during my off time? Well, of course, I've been a lot of my current role, which unfortunately ends next Monday, is doing helping people with their taxes. And that's a lot of research involved, especially when you get a return. I'll give you guys an example of the kind of tax returns any one of us could get on a call. Let me just give you guys an example. And tell me what you guys think. This would be something that would, if any of you had this tax scenario out there, I want you guys to tell me if you guys would rather get a CPA or if you would trust someone you know, who may have done taxes for a few years and so forth. Like for instance, I did taxes for quite a few years, but they were pretty much very similar. You know, living in a small town in North Carolina, most of the returns I did were pretty straightforward. Nothing really too complex. So here it is guys, here's an example scenario of a return that we might have, we might, we might get a call on. So you've got a taxpayer, they're married. One of them is a U.S. citizen. The spouse is a, she li the spouse doesn't live in the country and they live overseas. They have foreign income. They've got dividend, they've got both domestic and foreign dividends. Couple with that, they've got business income and rental income, multiple K-1s, and a business property they have overseas is a, is a rental business overseas. So yes, you can imagine, if I had a scenario, scenario like that, I would be bringing my taxes to a CPA. So that's the complexity of return. So obviously, depending on the client you're dealing with, they're not gonna wanna sit there for three or four hours as you try to break apart the return piece by piece. Okay, I'll be like, okay, let's figure this portion out. Okay, first, first thing first, we gotta figure out, okay, your spouse is a non, the non-resident lives overseas. Okay, then we have to, once you get that part of the return figured out, then you move on to the next one. You take it like step by step, but sometimes if you're not familiar with that, you gotta do a lot of research on it. And so of course, if I'm not, you know, if I'm not working, you know, sometimes during my free time, I'll be looking at, you know, different tax laws relating to like foreign income, uh, foreign tax credit, alternative minimum tax, and then on top of that, I'm also focusing on uh, trying to complete all the courses through a website called Analyst Builder. It's, a, it's an awesome website. I mean, it's like, it's, like college, it's like better than college level curriculum. You pretty much learn job ready skills. It's called Analyst Builder. If you're looking to get into any kind of analytics, I highly recommend you check out Analyst uh, Builder by Alex Freeberg. Very awesome site. And so I'm trying to complete all those courses and that's time consuming as well. And it looks like I got I got a couple comments here. Like they've switched it out, they've switched the way they've done this. So I don't know if I can actually see so it will let me see my con oh there there it is. I Zen Zen. I see your Okay, ah. Uh, Yes, there we go. Okay, I was able to get, so I got Zen, Zen here, the calling. Let's see, who else I've got, Himini. The temperature out here is about 58 degrees. Okay, and then someone's saying, Zen, Zen is saying something about Donnelly, when people like you went to the doctor, they give him autism spectrum diagnosis, and then they gave him free money SSR yeah no that's SSRI no that's see I know people I actually know people on the spectrum who are doing really well being on the spectrum does not mean that you are disabled uh, not unless of course like the only reason you would be disabled is if, like if you're someone that's like 
if you're not high functioning. So like I know a friend, uh, well, I used to be friends with them. I don't really hang out with them much anymore because you know, they've kind of got their new group of people to hang out with. But I know people, one person who's on the spectrum, he, he worked for Microsoft when it was first starting up and he retired at the age of 40. Yes, retiring at the age of 40 because he was with the company when it first started up. Probably got all kinds of stocks and all that. So he's doing pretty well. Owns two houses. I could never even imagine owning two houses, let alone in King County, Washington, where it's like the average cost of a home is like well over probably seven, eight hundred thousand dollars. And then, and see, I know of another person on the spectrum, and they are a very successful lawyer. So, being on the spectrum does not necessarily mean you can't work. Now, there are certain careers that are more suitable if you are on a spectrum, depending on your personality type, what your strengths and weaknesses are. But by no means is it something that would be that should be considered, you know, as a disability, meaning you can't work. Unless you're like someone that's got like full on autism and you're basically like needing self care the rest of your life. That's different. This is like high functioning, high functioning autism, you know, being, you know, neurodivergent and so forth. So I know I have some more comments here. So that's what I'm getting at is the amount of time that I've sacrificed by not going skiing has been well spent on, you know, expanding my knowledge on tax laws. And it's a challenge. Hey, Ellen. Okay, Ellen. Hey, DW. And we got she beat she by re. And so, yeah, like I was saying, some of the tax calls we get right now, because it's like the last week before filing taxes, you have a lot of people that are actually requesting to speak to a CPA. And we can't do that. We, we, we are not allowed, uh, well, they, it is highly discouraged to transfer a person. We have to do what's called de-escalation techniques. So that's probably some of the most challenging parts is when you come across a return that's super complex. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this stream, it's like when you combine, you know, mixed residential, you know, when you start mixing residential, you know, a person's residency then you start throwing in like business income rental income mixed in with foreign properties domestic properties domestic stocks foreign stocks capital gains from a foreign from a foreign account i mean that's just like i'm just like oh geez this is why i wish i had gone to school to be an accountant because to do this job as a cpa a cpa would a CPA would eat this job up, assuming they're a good CPA. I mean, <laughs> I mean, there are people out there who probably don't do the greatest jobs. And I've even had, I've even had some customers say that they, that they had to switch CPAs because one CPA knows some loophole in the system to where they're able to get that person a little bit of an extra refund or oh, a little bit less on those taxes. Like a common example is the. Uh, a backdoor Roth uh, contribution. Uh, that's a way where people can get a deduction on contributing to a Roth IRA if, they, if their income is too high. It's so what's called a backdoor, a backdoor Roth IRA. Another one that I saw that was complex is when it comes to like ES, ESPPs or something like stock options that a company provides. And oftentimes a taxpayer will be inadvertently double taxing themselves. And that's where some accountants are good at spotting where the taxpayer may be making that error and avoiding and helping them to avoid, you know, inadvertently double taxing themselves. So that's what I'm getting at. I mean, there is a reason why only one out of five people who take the CPA exam pass on their first attempt. Even chat GP, well, chat GPT, <laughs> yes, they actually, I read something where chat GPT took the CPA exam and scored like an 85%. So that's, I mean, 
Now, of course, that's an AI, that's, you know, that's artificial intelligence, but still, 85%, I mean, you do have people out there who are very knowledgeable, who are really good, you know, at retaining knowledge that could probably pass the CPA exam with a 90 plus percent, if not higher. So what I'm getting at is between my current role, which ends in a week's time, and trying to really hone in on revamp, revamping my resume, trying to complete these courses on uh, Analyst Builder, I'm really trying to fight really hard so that hopefully within a couple of months, I can get myself some kind of role and something unlike what I was doing last year. Because you guys all know what I was doing last year. I mean, yeah, it's like, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do, but you know, is it really worth, is it really worth it if it's at the expense of your mental health? And this is, this is common across, you know, cause that's, that's the other thing too is, it's one thing if I was like 18 years old or 19 years old, going to college, and working a job where I'm like washing dishes, serving customers, but then fast forward 30 years and you find yourself pretty much doing the same thing. That's a gut check to your confidence, I'll admit. And part of that, a lot of that I blame on my decisions relating to having goofed off in my 20s through by skiing. So in a sense, it's kind of like I'm taking out my frustrations on, on skiing and so by doing that, I'm refusing, I'm resisting that urge to want to go up to the ski area and get some skiing and resisting. And but besides, anyways, since I don't have a pass, trying to go up there and buy a lift ticket, forget it. If I want to go for a lift ticket, I'll be looking at 90, 96 bucks plus tax, $100, $100 if not more, just to get in a day of skiing. Not worth it. So do I still do any skiing? Yes, I do. But I only go up to do like a couple laps, you know, by hiking. I'll hike up and get a, you know, a couple laps and that's pretty much all I do. And so I am gonna say this, that if I do any skiing videos during the spring and summer months, just keep in mind that I'm gonna look like a total beginner. I'm gonna look like a total novice. So I'm just giving you guys a heads up because obviously I think I've only gotten in. Now keep in mind, this is, this is not using lists. This is just going up for a couple of laps on my days off. I think I've only gotten in like what, five days? No, four or five days in this year? Whereas the least amount of skiing I've had prior, any prior year was like 15 or 20 days. And that was like, when I first started skiing way back when I was like eight years of age. From pretty much 10, the age of 10 onward, I was like getting in at least a minimum of 30 days, 35 days throughout my late teens into my mid twenties, over a hundred days a season. When I got back from Florida, I was getting in between 60 and hundred days, 105 days. This year, bam, cinco, five days. And so, yes, the fact that my role is ending in a week's time is placing a lot of undue stress on me because, for one, it was nice to actually be doing a job to where I was kind of like applying a skill level that was much higher than what I've been applying in my previous jobs. And I have applied, I have tried applying for roles as an internal, can you know, trying to move from what I'm doing now, like move internally, but I don't have the experience. The only positions they have available are senior level, where you have to have like three or five years of experience. I gave it a go, I gave it a shot. I spent a few hours working on my resume, but it was a no-go. But hey, I, hey, at least I gave it a chance, I gave it a, I gave it a shot, but it was a no-go. And so now my next step is, I have another resume that's pretty much identical, but it's tailored to this other program called Career Forward. It's from hiring our heroes. And it's pretty much almost done. And so my hope now is I will submit that to the program coordinator that reach it, that basically 
puts my resume in a pool of candidates in which companies will select certain candidates based on their skills and offer them a fellowship. It's like an internship. So basically a fellowship is similar to doing an internship. You get hired by a host company, you work four days, and then on the fifth day, you do what's called the, the fellowship huddle, where they see how, how it's going with the company you're at, if there's any challenges you're facing, and it counts as experience. So it's like doing an internship. So hopefully I get something out of that. Hey, General Alec, Art and Soul, Alan Oakland. Yes. And yeah, and I got Lunar Light. Let's see. Okay. All right, so pizza, french fries, yes. I'm gonna be taking, if I ever get back into skiing, rest assured, I'm gonna be taking ski lessons. Because my form, my form was horrible, I'll have to admit. I never really had good form skiing. So, I would definitely be taking some ski lessons on learning proper form. I don't know if I would have to regress all the way back to pizza french fry technique, but then again, there is a method to why they do teach that. Pizza french fry basically is teaching you how to initiate edge control. Now, of course, pizza is when you're trying to slow down but depending on which way you want to turn, you can pressure your inside edge, you know, with more with either with your left or right leg, and that's going to initiate a turn. So there is a method and why they emphasize learning the pizza french fry technique first. And then from there they go on to like learning how to parallel ski. Because I've gotten some comments on my ski videos that will say something like, your stance is way too wide. Oh, you hunch over too much. Oh, you ski way too slow. And that's just because I never really had good technique. So yeah, okay. Man, art and soul. Hey, it's art and soul here, okay. All right, so I'm making my way up here. Hopefully I'm not too out of breath. I'm trying to keep my pace kind of low. Uh, I have gained, I finally gained a few pounds back. It's nice to be back over 180 pounds. But I'm not trying to gain too much weight, but I am trying to keep it to around 100, 180, 183 pounds. I was 100 and I got down to 172 during the early winter months. And that was a little too light for me. I was looking a little too skinny. So I can feel, I can feel I'm a little bit more out of breath given the pace I'm going than I was a, couple, a few months ago. But that's because I'm carrying a few extra pounds. Because normally this would be a very easy pace, but now I'm finding myself, I'm having to work a little bit harder to get up here. All right, so yes, that is the power of resisting the urge. It's, in other words, I guess you could say, some people would say it's discipline. You're, you're disciplining, you're like, you're, you're being disciplined, as in like, you're resisting to do what can distract you from focusing on your on your priorities. And it's just something that I'm like looking back and I'm like, wow, the ski season at resorts is about to end within a week or two and I've done it. I have resisted the urge to do any resort skiing, to do anything related to skiing on a regular basis that's been my number one pastime, my number one passion when it comes to physical activity since the age of seven and eight. Actually, eight was like my first full season of skiing. Yeah, eight years old is when I fell in love with skiing. And to find myself at the age of 49 being, oh, I'm so happy to have resisted the urge, in a way shows kind of like my, I don't like to use the word desperate, but I guess you would say that. It's kind of like my last ditch. It's like I'm sacrificing it as a last ditch effort to get myself into something that I enjoy doing. And while I have you guys live, a lot of you may be emphasizing why it seems like I may be picky with my career field. So for starters, having a sit down desk job, computer job, will enable me to really fully live, live life. Like for instance, let me give you guys a hypothetical horrific scenario. Let's say 
I was running on this trail and you see that up there? Let's say, let's say I had been running on this trail and there had been some snow on the trail, maybe a little bit of ice and I slipped on some ice and I tumbled down that ravine. Luckily, I would have my cell phone on me and let's say I broke both my legs, broke an arm, broke a few ribs, maybe even punctured uh, a lung, maybe even had a severe uh, breakage to where a rib even like punctured my heart, needed to go into like some life changing surgery, but I was still awake and conscious the next day after surgery. Well, if I had a job that involved having to be on my two feet, I would be out of work. I would be like, I'd be out of luck. But if I have a job where I'm working on a computer and I'm able to be awake the next day, maybe not exactly the next day, but you know, a few days, I'd be like, yeah, hey guys, yeah, that was a hor it was a horrific running accident I had, but I'm just glad to be back at work. I've at least got one hand I can type with. I can still show up to meetings. I can still complete my projects on time. And yes, being injured sucks, but it sucks more if you can't do your activities or work. So that's one of the big reasons why having a computer job would be very beneficial because then I can go out there and really live life to its fullest and not have to be worried about injuring myself to where I can't work. Okay, so someone, I've got a couple more comments here. So Art and Soul is saying, do you have fun skiing? That's always my focus. It is fun. I enjoy it. Hence, that's why I, I did it for so many years. I enjoy it. It's fun. It's one of, I think it's one of the more, it's dangerous, but at the same time, it's safe. Like compared to cycling, cycling, I could get ran over by a car. You know, that's the thing with cycling is cycling, you're at the mercy of other drivers out there. Whereas like when I'm skiing, I feel more safe, especially like when I'm hiking because I've got skis that are coming out my, the skis make me look big on my backpack. And the skis actually provide protection to the back of my neck. So for instance, like a cougar would have a tough time pouncing on me from behind because my skis are blocking the back of my neck to where a cougar is likely to attack if they're trying to kill their prey. I would look super big to a bear because the skis st stand up pretty tall and I don't have to worry about, you know, being hit by a car. So if anything, skiing, at least backcountry skiing is probably the safest activity I do, but that's a whole different thing. But yes, I do enjoy it, but skiing at resorts, it's a time commitment. Like I said, it's, you gotta drive to the resort. When you're up there, you start getting hooked on doing a ski run. Maybe you start getting hooked on doing a, the park. You start doing park laps. And this happened to me all the time. I would get up there like at eight in the morning at the ski resort. And I'd be like, okay, I'm just gonna stay here till about noon. But then next thing you know, the park opens up and I start doing park laps. And now it's like one o'clock. Then I eat lunch and I was like, oh, I've got to head back out there and get those afternoon ski turns in. Next thing you know, it's four o'clock in the afternoon and there's like eight day, eight hours out of the day, eight, 10 hours out of the day right there. And then I still got to drive back home. So that's like 10, 12 hours out of the day where I should be really focusing on my priorities. Now, once I get myself into my career field, then I can kind of, I can, I can, I can eliminate that restriction because then at that point, then it's just, you know, being able to do the things I, I want to do during my free time. So that's the whole, that was kind of the gist of this video. So yeah, here's this ravine that I'm talking about. And oftentimes there is usually a patch of ice that forms within this section of the trail right through here. And so it's very easy to slip on a very icy day, like if there's ice in the trail, slip and go off this embankment. And yes, I actually have slipped on this trail. I wa and I was only walking it. I wasn't running because I knew there was ice on it, but I still slipped. Landed on, luckily, I didn't break anything, but I did land on my elbow. And yeah, it, it, it hurt pretty good. 
But that's just an example of how if I had broken my arm or something, and let's say I worked at that deli clerk position, with a, I would not be able to work with a broken arm. But if, with a computer job, as long as I can type, still do my typing, I can still work. Plus, I just I like a job where I can utilize my mind. I'm, it's like being able to utilize your mind because your body, your physical body, is more likely to fail on you than your mind is. I mean, so that's kind of, and then you got the other aspect of too. A lot of the stuff I've, a lot of the things that people find bored, like, it's amazing how a lot of people will get bored by like working with spreadsheets or something. I don't know, just for me, that doesn't, for me, that doesn't bore me. There's always something I can figure out what to do with spreadsheets to either make them look better, use like conditional formatting, if they're using like Excel, organizing them more efficiently, whatever it may be. So it's like some people like to work with their hands. Some people love customer service. They love that constant interaction. So for me, after I'm done with this live stream, I'm gonna be like pretty much, that's it. That's all the social, that's all the talking I'm gonna wanna do for the rest of the day. So a big part of why you haven't seen me upload videos very often the past couple of months is because I am an introvert. I, I am admitting that I'm an introvert. I know a lot of you may think otherwise, but I am an introvert. And I, it's like, I'm, you know, that's, that's who I am. And so after a day, especially like earlier when I was working like, you know, six or so hours, constant interaction just wears me out. It's, it's just one of those things that's like, I don't feel like doing any more talking. So that's, I think what I've learned, what I've really learned this year about myself is that, yeah, come to think of it, I really am an introvert. So it's like, You're really quiet. Someone is saying I'm mute. Uh-oh. Someone's I don't know. Can you guys still hear me? Can you guys still hear? Can you guys hear me now? Because I Can you guys hear me? Hey, Johnny Ringo, can Can you guys let me know if you guys can hear me? I was getting a, I was getting some I was getting like a phone call or something. That may have been why. Yeah, so can you guys hear, can you guys? Okay, yes, yeah, so the sound is back. Okay, so I had, so, I had someone, someone here mentioned, but revolving your whole life around skiing and sacrificing your whole career around skiing, yes, is a wrong move. Yes, I am owning up to that was the wrong move. And I've paid the consequences and I still am paying the consequences. That is why it feels good to have resisted that urge. As that, that person pretty much said it spot on. Let me repeat that one more time. This is from Dev Pike. Ah, oh, shoot. But, okay, I'm reading this a lot because this is pretty much spot on. This is exactly why it feels good to have resisted that urge. So, he says, if you just go skiing once every two weeks, it won't hurt. You need leisure time. That is true. That's very true. You need that leisure time. And then, but revolving your whole life around skiing and sacrificing, the key word there, sacrificing your whole career around skiing, yes, that is a wrong move.
And a lot of people who've known me in the past, who met me on the mountain, especially those who met me on the mountain and who I used to be friends with in my late teens and 20s, they knew that. And hence, that's probably why they lost a lot of respect for me. So in, in a way, what I've done this year is, you know, I've kind of, I've kind of shown that like, it was the wrong move. So it's kind of, you gotta make that sacrifice. And I'm gonna continue to make that sacrifice. No, okay, I'm gonna continue to make that sacrifice until, until I get somewhere. So yeah, it's gonna be, eventually it'll get to the point where I may, I may, you know, will I ever return fully to skiing? Who knows? I may end up giving the sport up altogether at some point and just be like, you know, this was a fun sport. I gave a lot of heart to it, but it also caused me a lot of, a lot of turmoil and it damaged my career. So there are many other things in life that I can probably find joy from doing as, as leisure. I mean, you've got golfing, uh, you have, uh, you've got surfing. Uh, what else you've got? You've got, I mean, you've got, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things out there. You've got sailing. Well, let's see. You've got, I mean, there's just so many things out there. Uh, uh, taking up, uh, you know, joining a boxing gym uh, or mixed martial arts, karate, taekwondo, whatever, some other, or maybe joining a sports league, whether it's soccer or ultimate frisbee. I mean, there's other ways that I could probably find enjoyment in life and just put, kind of like, put the old me to rest. Cause yes, I feel like tying that sport of skiing to my identity is unfortunately also tying that kind of, you know, that, uh, that failure as well. So it's like I'm associating skiing with having failed at career. So it's kind of like, I enjoyed skiing, but at the same time, is it something that I can really live with. I don't know. Like I said, I don't know. Tomorrow, you know, tomorrow's a different day. But there are so many other things. To... So 66 cookies. So, so why do they lose respect for you? Oh, Dead Pike. That's a good question. Actually, I will tell you this. This actually happened. One of my closest friends. I'm not gonna say names because that's not respectful, but one of my closest friends, probably, I'd have to say, I had a couple, I had a few close friends. I'd say, I'd say this one was probably, uh, he was probably like, he was one of two of my closest friends. When I came back from Florida, he was like excited to see me. He was like, hey, how's it going there, squid? Because he was a Marine, he was a Marine. So like, you know how like, military members of different branches will joke with one another. Well, he was like, hey there, squid. You know, he invited me over to his house. We hung out. And when I told them that I was pursuing exercise science, he was like, I thought you wanted to, I thought you were gonna pursue accountant. I thought you wanted to be an accountant because he knew that I was preparing taxes before I went into the military. And he knew that I enjoyed working with numbers. He, and his response was like, when I, when I told him when I was going into exercise science, he was like, what are you thinking, Donnelly? You want to be, you, you're doing, you're going to waste all that money to be like a personal trainer. It's like going to accounting. And he was like, he was like, go on, you know, get your degree in accounting, work at some firm, because you're the kind of guy that will do really good at working on projects. You're someone that's like really good at being assigned a task, doing what you need to do to get it done. You're not a person that's meant to be a personal trainer. I know you, it's like, I know you, you're not that flamboyant person. You're quiet. You need to get yourself a job to where you work for a firm and you're given a project and you gotta do what you gotta do to get it done. Not personal train, not go into this career field that requires you to be like some flamboyant celebrity style personality type. And ever since that point, ever since then, we've never really spoken again. We've never hung out. 
And so that's just one example of what happened by choosing, by choosing the wrong degree and also, you know, skiing. Because he knew too that I was, you know, still getting into a lot of skiing when I had uh, come back to the state. So, yeah, unfortunately, making that decision to pursue the wrong degree, unfortunately, ended the friendship. And so who else? someone else is asking, 66 cookies, how did you end up in Bellingham, Washington? Well, long story short, uh, I had applied to two different, uh, two different colleges. Uh, one was Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Arizona, and the other one was Western Washington. Because I, I've also, from child, from my childhood, I've always had the dream of being a pilot. Maybe not necessarily a commercial pilot, but some kind of pilot. And so I had applied to Embry-Riddle. And the interesting thing is, even like, obviously if I had gone to Embry-Riddle and why I chose to came up here, guess what? Because I wanted to get my skiing in. Yeah, it was a, it was, it was a dumb decision because now the amount of debt I would have gotten in to get myself an aviation degree, an aviation meteorolo meteorology, <coughs> meteorology degree, I would be in the same amount of debt as, you know, as I was getting my master's in exercise science. Actually, I would be less in debt if I had actually gone to aviation school through Embry-Riddle than I would with my master's degree. I'm not going to say how much I'm in debt, but that's just, that's, that's the, that's like, that's how bad of a decision I made right there. It's like, I would have been better off living a few years in Arizona, seeing a different part of the country. But no, I, I came back to Washington state because I wanted to get that skiing in. So there you have it. Skiing has kind of pulled me in different directions away from priorities. And so I'm about to get up to the end point here. Let's see, and then... Okay, and then, let's see, well, let's see. And then, so I got, I don't think you should just quit. And then, so yeah, I mean, I really haven't... And so like, yeah, as far as, as far as like my, uh, my other close friend of mine, he actually ended up becoming a pilot at the age of 45. Yep. He went to flight school. He, you know, he took out loans, went to flight school, became a pilot at the age of 45. And now is flying commercial jetliners. As a, I believe by now he's probably like a first off, a first officer. And he started at the age of 45. So for all you people out there who want to be a pilot, if you think being 40 is too old, well, my closest friend in my late teens and early mid twenties became a pilot at the age of 45. So let that be of some encouragement to any of you out there who may be over 30 or 40 and want to be, and want to be a pilot. Yep, 45 years becoming a pilot at, at that age. All right, so let's see what else. Yeah, so he's doing, he's probably doing pretty well by now. You know, when he first started off, he was making minimum wage, which how, that's how it is when you first start off. But now he's probably making, he's probably making close to 100,000. He's probably making close to 100,000 by now, if not more, because pilots make a lot of money. Uh, they can make, they can make upwards of close to a half million dollars a year. But that's only if you've been doing it for like, you know, a couple of decades and you're like a captain, but still first officers can make well over a hundred thousand a year. All right. So I'm, I've come to my turnaround point up here. This is my turnaround point. And plus my battery is starting to run low, but here's my turnaround point for today. That took me what? 45 minutes to get up here. And I've got 20% of battery left. So I'm going to make some last minute responses to any comments I had. But yeah, if you're just joining in, I am going to be ending this in a few minutes. But yes, I have resisted the urge to not to to not do something that has strayed me 
that has put me astray from life's priorities. And as much as I love the sport, sometimes you just got to make that sacrifice. And so what, what it's done is hopefully, hopefully within, you know, within a short amount of time, I will have something else lined up because I've only got a week left on my current roll. So that's kind of, it's putting a lot of pressure, but hopefully within a short amount of time, because now my resume is a lot more, it's a lot more presentable. I've got something I can actually put on it other than my internship I did a couple years back. So hopefully between this fellowship program and applying for jobs, which I'm actually doing, I'm, I'm applying, you know, I'm applying to jobs at various companies. So hopefully between that, I will finally be on my way to getting somewhere. And once I do, then I can reevaluate, you know, what I'll do in my leisure time. But until then, yeah, until then, yep, just got to focus on my priorities. And yes, yeah, someone's saying, now do you see why I come up this mountain? Yeah, it's, a, it's very, it's, it's just a way for me to unwind coming over here. It's, it's not very far from where I live. Very easy access. The views may not be the most spectacular lower down, but the higher up you go, the better views you get. And you could act, there's actually like a network, well, there's, there's a, a loop trail and the tree, like, well, you can't see it, but there's actually a loop trail. Like, I'm actually next, pretty close to a hiking trail that's in those woods. I'm about probably 100 yards or so from a hiking trail that pretty much uh, goes along this uh, dirt road. The only reason, the reason why I like going up this dirt road is because you, you gain elevation quicker. That's kind of like what I like to do when I'm when I'm running or walking, I try to gain as much elevation as I can. So that's why I'm always on the road. It's just, it's steeper, you gain elevation quicker. On the trail, it's it's longer, so you don't gain as much elevation. Okay, so let's see, I got the other comments here. And uh, so yeah, so yeah, as far as, so Deb Pike was saying, he didn't need to dump you like that, it makes no sense. Yeah, we. I guess we just kind of like, you know, he messaged me a few times a few years back, but it was nothing, nothing really, uh, nothing really anything significant. I think the big, I think the big, the big, the big uh, turn, turning point at that was when, when he was like, I wasn't capitalizing on what my true strengths are. Cause yeah, it's like, I told him, it's like, yeah, I want to go, I want to get into exercise science because maybe I can be a coach or I can be this person or coach for a team. And it's like, to be a coach for a team, you've got to have, you've got to have a personality type that's like, I call it movie, movie type personality or like celebrity style personality type. Cause a lot of personal trainers out there, they struggle. They struggle to make ends meet. They don't really make, they don't make much at all. And you're having to work at very odd hours. And it's just, it's not a very lucrative career field. And you're doing a lot of hustling and soliciting. So yes, soliciting members over the phone when they come into the gym. Uh, and then of course, being a coach, well, you generally have to have a lot of experience even before you go into your degree program. And then it's, there are supposedly, there is a hidden market as far as like corporate fitness goes. I have seen someone mention that there's a corporate there's a corporate, uh, you can take like the corporate route and that's what someone did. But the problem with that is I look online for corporate level fitness jobs and they're really hard. It's like, there's really nothing out there. So I have tried that approach. I'm approaching another person. All right. All right, so yeah, so that's, but yeah, I've, I've tried, I've, I've actually tried, I've, I've tried that approach. I've tried looking for for fitness jobs like in a, in a corporate setting, but I, ha I haven't had any luck. Cause that's pretty much, you know, that's, that's pretty much what, you know, what I'm left to is because obviously getting a master's degree to be a personal trainer. Yeah, that's, that, that's, yeah, that's not gonna get you very far. Okay. All right, so I think, I think I got a few last comments here, but yeah, my battery is getting pretty low. I'm down to 20%. Hey, house of, House of GVN, House of 
house of JHVH. <laughs> and then we got, we got oat art. All right, so yeah. So I'll stay on for a couple more minutes, but I'm gonna be, you know, getting myself, get myself some lunch, get myself some lunch, going back. I don't work the rest of the day, but I am gonna focus on, you know, continuing on with these courses through Analyst Builder. And then tomorrow I'm gonna hit up the gym. I try to hit the gym now at least three days a week, uh, minimum. Yeah, so I'm gonna work, you know, do that tomorrow. Today I'm just gonna get myself some lunch, see how I feel. I may go to the, I may go to the gym today, but because I've spent, you know, quite a bit of time out here, if I do go to the gym, it'll probably be, I'll probably like hit up like shoulders and triceps if I do go to the gym. And then I'll do legs tomorrow. Cause I do, I don't want to spend too much time out of, the, out of the day doing physical activity when I'm, when, you know, when I can be working on upskilling. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at. And I also want to make this video because like I said, part, part of the, part of the, a big struggle with knowing that you made bad decisions in life and so forth it does it can it does like it, it affects your mind and sometimes you want to get things off your chest but then it's like well that might be a little too much maybe i should just delete that and so i know some of you have probably seen like okay why is this guy uploading videos and then they're not there anymore so it's kind of one of those things that maybe i should just even though I don't really expect to get much out of therapy, I am still in therapy, by the way. I just don't hold like any really, I don't hold any high expectations from therapy, but I'm still in therapy. It's just kind of a way for me to, I guess, vent. And so sometimes I wish I had an opportunity to vent more so, but I think venting on YouTube is probably not the best thing to do on a frequent basis. I don't know, that's just kind of what, what my what my feeling is. So I figure I just kind of do what I'm doing now just to kind of sh share some of the things that I've been doing to kind of remedy the situation. Yeah, so, oh, 400 milligrams of caffeine. That would be way too much. 400 milligrams of caffeine. That would probably give me an anxiety attack. I'm not joking. Anything above... Anything about 200 milligrams of caffeine starts giving me the jitters. So 400 milligrams would probably not be good. I would certainly not be able to do any physical activity if I had that much caffeine. I would feel like, I would feel like I'm about to pass out or have some kind of like heart arrhythmia. <laughs> okay, so it looks like... All right. Yeah, it's like got die one two. Okay, so I got. All right, so all right, I think that's gonna do it. I think that's gonna do it. I hope you guys enjoyed this, but I am gonna. I'll stay on for two more minutes, and that's gonna do it. I'm gonna make my way down because it's been almost an hour. I want to start getting back. So yes, yeah, so that's that's always. That's always a good to mix up cardio and weights. Yeah. I find that to get the best benefit if you're trying to put on size is to do weights first and then do light cardio after. Oh, if you're working on cardio, you would do your cardio first and then do like a lightweight session afterwards. But that then again, you know, I could be wrong. It's it's been, it's been a few years. I don't really know that subject matter too much now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, well, that's what it is. Well, that's what they say that exercise is when you're putting your body through the most stress. You're putting your body through the most stress during exercise, and hence, you get the gains because your body is adapting to that stress. Hence, like the theory, the theory of adaptation. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's what exercise does. It puts your body under stress. Your body. Your body adapts to that stress, and then in order to make gains, you got to put your body under more stress through exercise, and then it comes to a point where you reach a plateau that's pretty much determined genetically as to how much further you can progress at a certain point.
Yeah, so that's... I mean, there are some things I still remember from my degree, even though it's been, what, 2017. There are certain aspects I do remember that stick out. Like another one that I remember is called, like, clust doing cluster sets. That's like if you're trying to build, like, strength or power. So, like, typically, like, an example, let's say someone does deadlifts, and they do 5 by 5 at, like, 95%, like, 90% of their one repetition maximum. Instead, they might do cluster sets of, say, like, five clusters of three sets of three at, like, 85% of the one RM and like in between each cluster, they recover for like two or three minutes, but between each set within a cluster, they only recover for like 40 seconds. That's, that's an example of a cluster set. Then of course you've got various training modalities. You've got resistance training, cardio, plyometrics, uh, body weight training, uh, elastic training. <laughs> so, so what job do you want? What jo okay? So sixty six cookies is asking asking what job do you want that you applied to? So here are the jobs I've been applying to. Uh, some of them have been. Uh, one was a reporting business analyst. Another one was for a data entry clerk. Uh, one has been for a business analyst. A couple others have been for. Strategic analysis. Oh shit! Oh, that scared me. <laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, strategic. That can uh, Strategic analysis. Uh, what's another one? Uh, another job was for a business analyst, and then I'm going to be applying for a couple other data entry positions, and I'll probably continue to apply. Other ones that I'm looking into are bookkeeping, and any kind of like payroll clerk or administrative administrative assistant so any kind of job where i'm either working with spreadsheets or doing any kind of anything with data even if even if it's as simple as just inputting data into a database data entry because oftentimes data entry jobs it's not it's it's not just entering data into a database they can often involve doing work with spreadsheets and sometimes even doing some analysis too so data entry positions are not necessarily like uh, boring like a lot of people think they may be. There's actually a lot more to doing data entry than what people believe there is to it. Okay. All right. And then, yeah, I thought about business, process, automation. Yeah, let's see. That's, I haven't really thought much about that one, but that seems like business automation sounds like that would involve some kind of coding. So that would be, I mean, I could be wrong, but anything that I see with automation you know, it sounds like it would, it would it would involve some kind of coding. So that would be pretty cool. So anything that involves like, so it's pretty much anything that involves like with spreadsheets, working on like uh, user interfaces or uh, designing curriculum. Uh, there was a job that I was looking at, but they want four years of experience. It's actually someone designing curriculum uh, for courses for a, for a company for a big company they're getting they're a growing company they're a really good company but they want four years of experience and now i don't have that so i don't know i may apply for it anyways but i'm not really holding high hopes for it plus getting getting into that company is hard enough as it is and it's the same company i interned for a couple of years back it's a very same co even though i interned for them i have applied for a job it for jobs with that same company, but I get rejected. And so, yeah, I really haven't had much luck, you know, getting a job at that company I interned for. Now, maybe it was the ATS system that was kicking my resume out, so who knows, but yeah. So right now I pretty much use, uh, I'll be using LinkedIn and I'll be actually applying to the company. I use LinkedIn to, to search for jobs, but then I try to actually like apply through the company website because applying through LinkedIn, yeah, that's not gonna get that's not gonna get you really anywhere if you just if you just do a quick apply. All right, so like I said, I think it's time for me to get going. And so yeah, Python projects, yes, Python, yes, Python. That's actually what I'm 
one of the courses I'm doing right now through Analyst Builder is on Python. I've completed uh, a Python course, uh, Pandas for Data Analysis. Pandas is a Python library that's used for data visualization and data cleaning pro uh, processes. So I, took, I, fin I completed that course. I'm working on SQL. And what's the other one I'm working on? Uh, yeah, SQL. And I think, he, I think he just came out with a new course on his platform for Tableau. But yeah, he's, there's, like eight or, there's like eight or so courses on that platform. And they go, they go into great depth. And you get the chance to actually practice. Like, there'll be practice questions on it. And then he'll actually go through uh, a guided project. So that's what's really helpful is there's a guided, there's like a, a couple guided projects or sometimes I think, well, in some of his courses, I think he has like up to four guided projects. So that's really helpful because you get to apply the skills you learn on a guided project. And then you can go out there and find your own project and apply the skills that you gained from doing the course. So, so yeah, that's, yeah, Python, yeah, Python. And it's funny, there's a, a lot of jobs, you know, they may not necessarily list Python as a requirement, but I do see it as a preferred skill on many job on many job postings. You know, they'll, uh, and so guys, guys, I think that's gonna have to do it. I am down to 10% battery. I think you guys have seen enough. It's been an hour now, but I wanna thank you guys all for joining in. And so, I'm going to get going now, but yeah, like I said, hopefully, hopefully I'll have some luck and get myself a job within the next couple of months, you know, until then, yep, just got to re resist the urge, focus on priorities. That's my final message to you guys is if anything has been derailing you in your lifetime, but you really enjoy it, sometimes you just got to resist the urge and focus on priorities. So with that being said. Take care, everyone. I'll see you guys soon enough. Till next time, peace out.